Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a very interesting explosion that was recently discovered in the old data from the Kepler telescope that happened a few years ago in a very interesting region of the skies. So let's talk a little bit more about this unusual explosion and welcome to What The Math. So when it comes to different space explosions, there are obviously things like supernova, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, and this is what you just saw happen right here, but there are also explosions known as nova, which is actually a very different type of an explosion and is a very different concept even though the name itself is very similar. And one of the more famous well-studied stars that actually do have a lot of these nova happening and we've seen at least four of them in these four uh, time periods are so-called WZ Sagittas stars. Here is what the star kind of looks like in Space Engine, and as you can see, this is actually a binary system. There is a brown dwarf right here, this is what we're looking at, and it's orbiting a white dwarf star, that's essentially what our sun will become uh, one day as well. And what's really happening here is essentially a kind of a tidal uh, interaction between these two objects. The white dwarf itself is um, possibly about half the mass of our sun, but the brown dwarf that's orbiting around it is a lot less massive. So maybe about 8% of the total mass of our sun. And essentially it's losing a lot of mass, creating a beautiful accretion disk around the white dwarf, as you can see in this illustration from NASA. And all of this is a result of the tidal interactions between a very dense object in the middle, which is the white dwarf, and the not so dense object, which is this brown dwarf that's right here. These systems are for the most part relatively rare, but they are not very difficult to see simply because of these occasional nova events that they produce. And all of the nova events are essentially different types of explosions that are not supernova. In other words, they're basically uh, temporary and usually repetitive re events that happen when certain conditions are met around the star. Now this is one of the more famous ones, this is the V838 Monoceros that I've talked about in one of the previous videos. But for the most part, all of the nova have a very similar principle. The more dense object, that's usually also smaller in size, collects a lot of material in the accretion disk around itself, and then eventually the material acquires what's known as a critical mass and initiates a nuclear reaction, generating a tremendously powerful nuclear explosion. Literally a nuclear bomb going off, but way, way more powerful than anything we've produced on Earth. And so this is kind of what happens around these systems, and normally um, they're actually really interesting for us to study because we would like to learn more about what exactly happens around these systems, and most importantly, how this actually transforms the galaxy and interstellar space around us. But also, this is possibly what our sun and the future of the solar system might look like one day as well. Although we'll talk more about this near the end of the video. But so what exactly did the scientists recently discover? So by now an active Kepler telescope that was responsible for discovering a lot of various exoplanets around the galaxy was also very good at just noticing different flashes in the night skies. And completely by accident, while looking through the old data that Kepler produced over the years, the scientists behind this paper discovered that near the star that Kepler was observing there was a very unusual appearance of the object that you can see right here that lasted for just uh, a little bit over a few days. And then it just like that it disappeared and never appeared again. And this of course suggested to the scientists that they just discovered yet another one of these WZ Sagittae stars. But as you can see, in the original image there was practically nothing visible here. So in other words, this object was invisible to us and appeared completely by accident and uh, nobody actually even knew that it was there. This is actually sort of what it looks like in visual light, you can barely even see it, and this only lasted for a few days. But the reason it became so visible is because the actual luminosity went up by about 1600 or almost 2000 times. So essentially it's as if the star system suddenly became 2000 times brighter than it used to be, and then just like that over the next few days, it dropped in luminosity and then disappeared again. And by analyzing the data, the scientists have already been able to establish what exactly they were looking at, even though the star is technically now invisible once again. So first of all, this is of course a white dwarf, and here we're just going to use Sirius B, which is the closest white dwarf to us. 
and it's orbited by an object known as a brown dwarf. And here there's actually a lot of mysteries about these objects as well because we're not entirely sure how they're made, but one of the possible explanations will be near the end of this video. So this is a Jupiter and if we want to produce a brown dwarf out of Jupiter, we just have to multiply its mass by anywhere from 10 to maybe 80 times. So here, once I increase its mass, um, its size will not actually change that much. It will still be around the same size as the original Jupiter, which you can see right here for comparison, but its density will increase. And because of this, it will also acquire a lot more temperature, which you'll see in a few seconds here as it slowly warms up. Here I might have to accelerate time a little bit just for us to actually see the effects a little bit quicker. Now, these brown dwarfs are all over the place. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've discovered quite a lot of them even very close to our sun. But they are not very easy to see, mostly because they only produce a lot of infrared light, but not so much visible light. And here we can even see that the average temperature on the surface of this object is around 180 degrees Celsius, making this a relatively toasty object on the uh, side facing the star, and somewhat cool with the temperature about minus 28 degrees Celsius, on the opposite side away from the star. But in this simulation, the uh, orbit here takes approximately three days. In reality, the orbit is much, much quicker. It actually only takes about 83 minutes for this brown dwarf to orbit the white dwarf in the middle. In other words, their orbit sort of looks like this. And because of the proximity to the white dwarf, it's going to start losing a lot of mass here. You'll see this in a few seconds as soon as we run the simulation for a little bit. Now, it instantly transformed into a much hotter object than it used to be because of the proximity, and here it's also going to start leaking some of its mass, although it might take a while. And eventually this will form an, a kind of an accretion disk right here around the white dwarf, and this will then start forming these very energetic nova that will produce very large explosions once every few years. Although we don't really know how often this particular object takes to generate these nova, but normally takes anywhere from a few years to possibly even a few decades. And because these accretion disks are so ubiquitous, they're essentially all over the universe. They're near black holes, near neutron stars, white dwarfs have them, um, different types of planets have them, and of course baby stars have them as well. It's very important for us to understand how these accretion disks form, how they actually are maintained, and most importantly, how they transform the galaxy and the universe around us. Because since they're all over the place, there's gotta be a lot of activity inside of these um, unusual accretion disks that might end up producing seen a lot of various materials that we might even have here on Earth. And also since everything in the universe seems to like making accretion disks, even the, the galactic shape itself is a kind of an accretion disk, it becomes even more important for us to understand how the mechanisms of formation of these disks work. But in this particular discovery, it's the actual event that's really interesting. It's the so-called superburst, basically when suddenly all of this material becomes super critical and explodes with a tremendously powerful effect that can technically be visible from really, really far away. And this is what we think happened here, although it's very likely for us to even have found this because normally this only lasts for a few days as I mentioned, and after this the star goes quiet for many, many years. And what's interesting here is that the analysis shows that normally the temperature inside the accretion disk is very close to the temperature of the surface of the sun, about 5000 degrees Celsius. But during a superburst, it increases to about 11 or even 12,000 degrees Celsius, essentially doubling. And this is where we would really like to find out more about what causes these thermal instability events and how they progress, and most importantly, what effect they have on the galaxy. And in the system that we just found, what's interesting here is that we think all of this is connected to how the orbit around the star forms a kind of a resonance. Basically, you might remember how Jupiter's moons have a resonance. For every one orbit of Io, Europa does two orbits and Ganymede does four. And this type of resonance generates a very stable system around Jupiter. But when these resonances form around white dwarf brown dwarf systems, they might end up creating just the right conditions for a nuclear event to occur. So basically, whenever the ring here starts having a resonance with the actual brown dwarf orbiting around the white dwarf, it then creates just the perfect conditions for the sudden explosion to occur. So by being able to predict when these resonances occur, we might be able to find a way to predict no events a lot more accurately. Right now we're not entirely sure when they actually occur and what specifically causes for them to trigger. 
And um, the last thing I wanted to mention here is that this could be the future of our solar system as well. As a matter of fact, this is the more likely outcome of what the sun might look like in approximately 12 to maybe 13 billion years. And this here could be the face of future Jupiter. Because today we know that at some point our sun will actually become a white dwarf as well. And prior to this, our sun will actually be what's known as a red supergiant, swallowing planet Earth and very likely expanding to the point where it loses its outer shell and throws out a lot of material generating what's known as a planetary nebula. So this is kind of what it might look like. Some of this material might also end up falling into Jupiter or actually ends up being absorbed by Jupiter because Jupiter will still be orbiting around the uh, remnant sun. And as Jupiter grows larger and larger by absorbing more and more material, at some point it might acquire enough mass to become a brown dwarf as well. Because remember, it just needs to have about 10 masses of Jupiter to be technically a brown dwarf. But while it's absorbing all this mass, it will also start moving closer and closer to the white dwarf basically our sun, and eventually we'll end up in a very similar position as you see right here. So technically this is the future sun, this here is the future Jupiter, and our solar system will very likely look somewhat similar to this. But this is of course in a really really far future, even past some of the other events such as the uh, collision between the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way. So by then, our galaxy is going to be very different, our solar system is going to be very different, and it's also very likely that Earth will no longer exist. It will probably get swallowed by the sun. And so by discovering more of these objects and learning a little bit more about them, we'll definitely have a much better picture of what's going to happen to the solar system in a few billion years from now. But until we discover more unusual or interesting things that will explain the future of the solar system, that's really it. You can check out the paper I mentioned in the description below and don't forget to subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe support this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot and most importantly come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. But anyway, I'll see you tomorrow, come back tomorrow, space out and as always bye bye.